The Mr. Beacon Podcast presents RFID versus Bluetooth with guest Mike Kastner. The Mr. Beacon Podcast is brought to you by Williot. Scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth. So, Mike Kastner, thanks so much for uh, coming on to the show. I'm really excited to have you for many reasons. Um, uh, we met uh, a few weeks ago, and you've got this amazing background in the RFID space. And for ages, I've wanted to do a show about RFID versus Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. And when we first met, you, you actually did a pretty good impersonation of someone who had read my book, and you pointed out that it's a Bluetooth beacon book, but we talk about RFID. And, I, and the goal of this show and the book was to really give ammunition and a resource to solution designers, which could be um, a conventional technology architect, or it could be a sales guy or an entrepreneur. And I think figuring out when you're going to use one tool versus another is really central to designing good solutions and being successful. And it's a question, it's a big question, when do I use RFID and when do I use Bluetooth? And so that's what we're going to talk about. And you are absolutely qualified to go toe-to-toe -to -toe on this smackdown between these technologies because I think because of your background because you've worked in Impinj uh, who at semiconductor maker amongst other things so you've seen RFID from the chip side and from your time at Mojix you've seen it from the infrastructure side as well and you've been a very senior uh, senior vice president responsible for sales so you know where it's a good fit and where it's not a good fit and you've also been responsible for services and making this stuff work mm -hmm. so I can't think of a better person to have on the other side of this table. Well thank you and uh, I must return the compliment as uh, it is an honor to be sitting here with Mr. Beacon uh, who is the very authority of everything BLE and, and Beacon technology related so I look forward to a spirited discussion. Here. All right okay and we probably won't come to blows and we may actually end up agreeing on everything but I, I'm hoping there's going to be some disagreement because that's going to make it interesting. Let's start off by defining terms. So RFID is a big umbrella. Um, uh, and as someone who's kind of new to that world, can you explain to me what does that umbrella encompass? Well, there are uh, some variations of RFID technology and fundamentally you can break them into uh, the three different frequency bands um, by which they operate. So there's low frequency, uh, and solutions there typically run at uh, 125 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. uh, those solutions have a read range of up to 10 centimeters uh, and are, have a lower data rate uh, but tend to be more robust in, in environments where there's uh, interference from uh, metal and liquids. So is that like the tags we use to get into the door of our office? Access control is a very uh, large application for LF uh, or low frequency technology. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So that's LF. Then there's HF right. and um, that is high frequency and uh, the high frequency technology is in the uh, 30 to 300 megahertz range okay. and uh, systems there typically operate in uh, at uh, 15 point or 13.56 megahertz. Mm -hmm. uh, they um, uh, have the benefit of giving you a higher data rate and um, uh, a bit longer reading different uh, distances up to one meter. What about the car keys? What are they? Actually, that would be HF, the car HF. keys. Yeah, okay. All right. And uh, ticketing is a very popular uh, application. Um, also, near field communications or NFC is a high frequency or HF technology. Ah, so, so give me an example of a ticketing application with uh, HF. Well, uh, your subway uh, uh, tickets that you would oh, okay. uh, purchase and, right. and, and use that for access. It's generally a near field uh, right. application. And so you mentioned uh, NFC, uh, which is typically associated with a tap, but normally the tap is like you're like literally tapping, you're not doing it from a distance. That's correct. Um, and uh, NFC has its own unique protocols, but it does uh, operate at that 13.56 okay. uh, megahertz. So we're going up the frequency spectrum. Um, what's, where's the next stop? Then you have ultra high frequency, okay. or UF, UHF technologies, yeah. and they operate in the 860 to uh, 960 megahertz band, okay. uh, typically at, at 900 or 915 uh, megahertz. 
And uh, they offer, uh, that UHF technology offers the largest read range, uh, typically around 10 meters, mm -hmm. um, although there are some systems that can read it at, at greater distances. Uh, and um, uh, so they have that advantage. Uh, the downside for UHF technology as opposed to um, LF or HF is that they're most susceptible to interference challenges to liquids uh, or um, reflections in, in environments where there's lots of metal. However, uh, over time, um, there have been some nice innovations and uh, uh, that enable uh, there to be tags that can read near metal or near water fairly fairly well in the UHF domain. Oh, cool. So, 800, 900 megahertz, is there any um, guidance in terms of when a particular band is used? Is it like a regional thing? Well, actually, yes. Uh, so there's the um, FCC and Etsy really kind of have the difference. So Etsy between zero. The, yeah, that's correct. The, between the 800 or 900 and 915 uh -huh. uh, megahertz. Beyond that, um, it, it's one of those two frequencies. Okay. And um, I, I'd heard that 2.4 gigahertz, there's a RFID standard there, but that seems to be less common, right? That, that's correct, yeah. yeah. And of course, 2.4 gigahertz is where my world comes in, the world of Bluetooth. Although actually I'd like to say, I feel like my, I'm trying to make my world much broader um, because these are like different tools in the toolbox, right? It's not like one's better than the other. Well, but I think one is better than another for, for a specific application. But it'd be like saying, um, you know, are chisels better than saws, it's, it's, they're just different tools. And the key Correct. thing is when you use one versus the other. So, so what is RAIN UHF? Uh, RAIN is an alliance that has um, uh, been uh, formed to standardize uh, and bring more attention to uh, the uh, EPC Global uh, UHF, Gen 2 UHF protocol. And, um, and so it's it bringing brand and image to, um, uh, and, and marketing muscle to the UHF RFID domain. So let's talk about the readers of this technology. You've got tags and you've got readers. Um, and I'd like to figure out, you know, let's position the difference between a typical Bluetooth reader uh, and an RFID reader. Um, there's more than one kind of RFID reader though, isn't there? Yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, you have uh, two general categories for readers. There's uh, fixed readers and there's portable readers. So a fixed reader uh, would be generally fixed in a single position. There's different variations of those types of readers. Uh, a very common one is a, a four port reader that can read uh, up to uh, four or support up to four antennas. There's others that are um, in the category of wide area reader systems where uh, you can either network a uh, a series of readers together uh, in an overhead grid formation to um, cover a large space and be able to activate all the tags and read all the tags in that, that space. Uh, one company, Mojix, has the uh, ability to partition the transmit from the receive, so in that case you are um, uh, using essentially lower cost antennas to just activate the antenna or the, the, the tags and, and therefore a, and, and one or a few receivers to um, be able to receive the signal uh, from, the, from those. Uh, so those are all f uh, variations of fixed readers. So you have the reader, which is the radio. That's right. And it could, unlike the world of Bluetooth, where typically the, the reader and the antenna are intertwined because they're in a phone or maybe they're in a, a hub, UHF's uh, RFID seems to be a lot more modular we could have a bunch of antennas up in the ceiling that are all connected to a single reader via coax. Is that how it works? In the case of the Mojix system, um, yes, that's, that's accurate. Uh, there are other uh, wide area solutions uh, that essentially use individual readers that are integrated into the antenna mm -hmm. and then connect them by uh, power over ethernet or ethernet cables in a grid formation. So there's two different approaches that are typically out there. Um, for wide area coverage systems. And if I've got an antenna, if I've got four or eight antennas that are talking to one reader, does the reader know which antenna has seen a tag? Can I, or does it all look the same to them? It depends on, on the system, but okay. generally, yes. The, right. the, it, you can, uh, so 
When you place these readers in a grid formation, um, it is possible to develop algorithms that um, can take advantage of either the radiometric information from the tag or understanding which antennas are firing at, at different times uh, to approximate the location of, of the tag. Um, and, and so uh, you, uh, in, you know, some leverage RSSI, uh, others use other, other approaches, but essentially uh, there is a, a proximity of tag to um, uh, receive antenna. Uh, or antenna that's firing that, that can be uh, used to um, uh, determine location. All right. And how big are these antennas? Because my image, in my mental image of these readers is that they're pretty big. Most readers can leverage a variety of antennas. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so you can uh, optimize a system design to leverage, uh, to control the uh, field of a, uh, the antenna pattern uh, by leveraging certain types of, of, of antennas. But generally speaking, um, RFID readers, UHF RAIN RFID readers will leverage a, a, a patch, a lotus patch antenna that's maybe 10 inches by 10 inches. There are some array uh, type solutions that um, uh, uh, integrate a array antenna with a, a, a reader and in those cases uh, the, the form factor will be a, a bit larger. Does size go with the cost? I, I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm kind of holding on to the fact that I can have a $50 Android phone that can be reading. Obviously, it's going to have, that's portable, so maybe that's not a fair comparison. But if I've got a, a Bluetooth reader, this will be like a hub uh, from you know, any number of companies, Mist, from Cooper. Um, th there's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of the players out there. Um, those are you know, maybe a $500 cost for a centralized unit. So it's not the same thing, but it's how much am I going to be spending if I want to cover a, a room and invest in the RFID infrastructure? Well, if we look at um, kind of going, jumping a bit ahead as yeah. to when you might choose Bluetooth versus yes. uh, uh, RAIN RFID, um, the fundamental difference is in the cost of the tagging sensors um, themselves. So well, that's where you have a huge advantage. So the cost of the tags is really, really low. And so if we look at pricing out the solution, then it really depends what's going to be the cheaper. But generally speaking, my perception is that the RFID infrastructure is, is more substantial, and it costs more, and it takes more to install. That's right. So uh, a, a, a RFID reader that is a fixed reader versus a portable reader, you know, could be in, you know, it's in the hundreds of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be around $800, could be, you know, $1,200, some, somewhere in that, that range. If it's a wide area system where they're integrating the antenna in and a reader together, uh, then it, it could be a bit higher. Then you've got to factor in, um, you know, how many of those uh, readers you're going to need to cover a, a system solution. Mm -hmm. It could be that you're uh, looking at uh, merely presence detection and you want to uh, place uh, antennas and, and, and the readers that drive them uh, around choke points and, and you may need just a, a, a few fixed readers. It could be that you need tens or possibly hundreds of antennas, in, in, in which case we're talking about a much more involved and costly system. And this is typically coaxial deployment? Uh, in the case of the Mojic system, they leverage uh, coax cables to mm -hmm. um, uh, connect the antennas and associated devices back right. to the reader. Uh, uh, others uh, leverage uh, Ethernet cable, so mm -hmm. Cat5 cable for um, both the power and the, the control for the uh, devices that are um, uh, essentially connected together. So with that, would you be able to leverage the same infrastructure that's being used for the Wi-Fi access points, or are you having a separate... Um, it would be a separate um, a system, generally okay. speaking, although uh, there are um, uh, some products on the market that do include uh, Wi-Fi access points. All right. Yeah. It's, such, it's such a diverse market that it's really tough to, to generalize, but we are going to generalize and kind of, if we were to take a snapshot now, I think anyone who's doing the mental arithmetic is saying, wow, this is a lot more money than Bluetooth, but we're going to come on to some other things that kind of balance it out later. So. But let's finish off the reader space. So we've, you've given an overview of the fixed readers. Yep. Um, and 
Uh, you talked about choke points. I guess there's these gateway things. It's another kind of fixed reader that you, I think, alluded to a little bit. It's a, but a, a system configuration utilizing a fixed reader. Right. And how, if I'm going to have a conveyor belt with a gateway around it, is that what sort of ballpark is that? Well, again, it depends on, on how many read points you need for that particular use case yeah. to give you the data that's, that's required. It could get away with a single reader, could require multiple readers. Okay. Um, so that's that. Let's talk about the portable readers. So the other category yeah. would be uh, handheld or portable readers. Yeah. And there's a variety of solutions out there. Uh, often the, um, uh, they combined a barcode with a, a RFID scanner into a single device. Could be a standalone industrialized unit. It could be a sled that could adopt a, uh, a mobile phone mm -hmm. um, as the user interface. Uh, it's even possible to purchase um, uh, attachments for a smartphone that can give you uh, R uh, RFID read capabilities. Seems like that would be quite reasonably priced, quite low priced. Uh, but what I, my sense is that you can spend thousands of dollars on a, on a handheld reader. Why would you go for spend? So what, give us a sense of the price range and why we might go to one versus the other end of that spectrum. Yeah. So um, generally, in RAIN RFID, the use cases are in industrial, uh, retail. And, and other places where you may need a, a ruggedized form factor. Mm -hmm. um, also, there is you know, software, value-added software that is bundled in, uh, you know, with these devices. So there is you know, more value than just the pure hardware of the mm -hmm. reader in, in many of these devices. So they typical, typically you know, can be in the $1,000 you know, to $2,000 range for a, a handheld device. But generally, you need fewer of them uh, than you would in a fixed infrastructure scenario. Is there just a general move to having adapters to go onto Android phones, or is it that need for robustness and all that other value-added stuff that's still keeping the the dedicated device market? Yeah, the um, uh, the Android or iOS, you know. Um, RFID attachments, if you will, for, for those, those mobile devices have been around for a while. And uh, they certainly haven't hit mainstream to you know, my level of visibility there. Right. So I think generally um, in retail, industrial, and, and other applications, they're, they're using more of the ruggedized um, or sled approach to um, uh, portable handheld devices. So up till now, we've got... Uh, uh, a technology infrastructure that is significantly more expensive than, than Bluetooth, I would say. Um, but it has some qualities which kind of uh, the Bluetooth doesn't have. And one of the things that really struck me was I was on a meeting the other day and someone was uh, from the RFID world was asking about Bluetooth because my day job is we have a product that's kind of combining the two. And so they're like, OK, well, so what's the read rate for Bluetooth? I'm like, what is the read rate for Bluetooth? And, and it's just not something we talk about. We talk about transmit rate all the time in terms of beacons. But read rate is one of the parameters that you guys, it's kind of part of the basic currency and dimensions of a, of a, of a system. So explain to me what is read rate and typically what are the range of read rates that you see and why is that important? You know, I think an important distinction to make as leading into that question is um, when we're talking about beacon technology, we're often talking about proximity, yes. uh, location and proximity technology, right? Yes. Whereas, uh, uh, and, and so in that case, um, the primary use case or application is, is, is knowing when someone in their iOS device or Android device is coming within range of a beacon. Yes. Um, uh, whereas in, in RFID, uh, the paradigm to think about there is with RAIN RFID, the primary focus is item level tracking of inventory of assets and, and, and people. Yeah. And, in, and in that scenario, um, the tag detect rate or the read rate uh, is in fact a, a very important factor for consideration of your RFID system. So if you are looking to replace or improve the inventory accuracy in a, in a brick and mortar retail store, uh, which might be using barcode every three to six months mm -hmm. uh, to for the purposes of, of inventory tracking. Um, 
their average inventory it, uh, accuracy at any given time could be 70%, 60, mm -hmm. 70%. But um, with RAIN RFID, um, you have the potential to get that accuracy up into the 98, 99% accuracy. Now, in RFID, and as I mentioned earlier, RAIN RFID, being ultra high frequency, is more susceptible to interference. And therefore, uh, if you think about a typical retail environment uh, or a, a warehouse, there could be uh, many um, points of um, uh, uh, reflection, things that can metal and, and other things that can cause um, multipath signals. And um, uh, in that environment, you can have tags that are, find themselves in an RF null, where you're not able to read that particular tag at that given time. Now, it could be that someone walking by is enough, just that factor is enough to uh, change the RF dynamic so that you're able to read that tag at, at, a, at a different instant, or people may be shuffling through inventory. But this is, uh, when people are talking about what is the read rate of, of Bluetooth, or what is the read rate of RFID, this is, uh, these are the factors or the considerations that they're, that they're concerned about. So read rate is basically how many tags can my reader read in a second? And it seems to me that, correct? Or how many tags are I able to read at all, right? In the scenario I just described okay. where a tag could be in a null, it may not be readable for hours. Well, let's make sure that people really understand what this null is. So we kind of think of these radios as broadcasting out this sphere of, uh, uh, of radi radio radiation, yes. but um, that's actually not how it works. And in the book, we have a picture of a delicious powdered donut as a way of explaining how this works in the Bluetooth world, right. where there's it's kind of this this uh, Saturn type. Well, it's donut shaped, and so so if we're looking through the donut, you can see nothing. So if there's a tag that is attached to a piece of apparel. Uh, a sweater, a jersey that's on a shelf in a store, potentially the reader's up here and the hole in the donut is pointing right at it. And what you're saying is actually we, we, we tend to think about multipathing and interference as being a bad thing, but maybe that will work for us in some cases where the signal that might not have been detected by the reader is going to bounce off someone that is walking past in the part of the donut that's solid and it will end up being read by the reader. Uh, that's correct. Is, is, what you have to keep in mind is in uh, RAIN RFID, uh, there's no power source for the tag. So the tag is entirely reliant on capturing enough signal strength that's transmitted from the reader to power up that tag and um, have enough energy to send a signal back to the reader. So if you, in, in some reader systems, they're more susceptible to um, uh, any interference that could occlude maybe the direct line of sight, if you will, of that RF signal. And if there's a, a metal barrier between the tag and the reader itself, it's going to cause reflections. And maybe there's enough reflected energy that gets to the tag to wake it up and send a signal back. Maybe there's not. It, you know, it could be the case that with the multipath signals that you have just like a sinusoid, the signals actually working against each other and canceling each other out, and you're not going to get any um, any RF signal to that tag in, in, in that particular spot. You could move it over just a, a few centimeters and there it's all of a sudden it's out of that null and it's enough to wake it up. So the reader is providing the energy, yep. so it needs to have a bunch of batteries associated with it or to be wired into the, into the power through the coax or whatever the cabling is so that it can send out a carrier wave, just a, a, a strong signal uh, and then it'll get uh, backscatter, uh, will essentially reflect back the signal to, to the reader. And for this reason, your what's the benefit of that in terms of the tags? Cost. Okay. Right? And no, po no battery source. Now, there are, we, we didn't talk at the uh, top of the show about uh, the fact that there's uh, active 
uh, RFID, which would have its own transmitter and power source. There's passive, which I just talked about, and in the context of RAIN, we're talking about passive tag. There's also a category called battery-assisted passive, um, which does have a battery in the tag, but it, it basically only um, it uses that battery when there's an, a, a, an RF signal from a reader uh, in the range, and that can help extend the range. But going back to okay. our, 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 our point of, 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 of uh, discussion here. So we've got active, passive. Battery assisted. Battery assisted. Passive. Battery passive. assisted passive. OK. Uh, and, and, and that can be used for like keeping sensors I'll going. I'll keep that out. So That's a detail we yeah, don't need to get we'll, into. We'll move that okay. to yeah. the side. That's yeah. another show. Yeah. Um, so let's get back to the price of the the tags, they're yeah. cheaper. Oh, that's what it was, yes. Yeah, they're cheaper because there's no batteries. Right, right, exactly. And they can be smaller, and, and the actual production process is, is right. different. You don't have a printed circuit board. You know, Bluetooth, we have a printed circuit board, we have a chip, we're right. soldering things together. That's right. There is no soldering. You guys are gluing your stuff together. And Correct. It's being spat out of a big Molbauer machine, which is like uh, quite expensive, but basically like a huge photocopier that's producing these things at an incredible rate. Yeah. So the cost is lower. How low is low? Well, it, we're talking about a simple label tag where yeah. uh, we, where you're basically um, sandwiching a RFID chip and um, uh, and an antenna between a label and um, an adhesive sur surface. We're talking about pennies, right? Uh, with no battery to maintain over time or change. So if I'm buying no, like a change. thousand of these, if I'm buying a thousand of these, am I, can I get them for like 15 cents, 12, 15 cents if I'm buying a thousand? Probably, that's right. Yeah. And if I'm buying millions and billions, then I'm guessing I can... Well sub 10 cents or later. Yeah. That's right. I've heard sub 5 cents for the people that are buying billions. There's yeah. a few retailers that are in that kind of space and there's a few CPG companies. One of so that that's, is that's, that's, incredible. That one of the advantages of RAIN technology, right, is, is because it's a passive technology, you can leverage just the chip in a, in a simple label, you can attach it to a substrate, you can package it any way that you want for a specific use case. So uh, there are hard tags out there for industrial purposes that could take an AK-47, right? They're hardened. Now those tags may be, you know, one to three dollars, right? So it's more of a function than the packaging uh, than it is the silicon costs or even the antenna technology in most cases. So the way you framed it, I think, was kind of probably the way it, the, indus the Bluetooth industry and the RFID industry, I think, had kind of staked out their camps and RFID had really gone into the asset tracking and Bluetooth was about stationary beacons and location and your phone's waking up, it sees the beacon, you can do wayfinding. And in my mind, hands down, Bluetooth is superior for that proximity marketing where you're talking to a handset. But things have changed and actually the Bluetooth industry is now moving from just beacons to tags so things that move and are attached to, uh, to, to mobile assets. And I think our Bluetooth industry is seeing this huge pot of gold and the value of getting into the, um, into the asset tracking space. And maybe we don't quite know what we're getting into there. So I'm gonna put a stake in the ground and I'm gonna say Bluetooth is clearly superior in terms of that proximity use case where someone's got their phone um, and they don't have any sleds or anything and they just want the phone to see the, um, the beacon and it's gonna wake up their app. Would you give me that? I would give you that. Okay, so, but now we're moving into the Bluetooth guys are getting greedy and they're seeing all this, this prospect of not just selling uh, a few hundred beacons but thousands of beacons and now they're mobile so that we're calling them tags. So, um, you know, what, what is it that we don't know? Where is it that you think that Bluetooth is weak in that environment? Well, if we're talking about uh, presence or location tracking of, of assets, right, then um, you need something to collect that information. Mm -hmm. And in RFID, you have readers, either it's a, a, an active or a, a passive solution. Um, in 
Bluetooth technology, and we're looking at, at uh, BLE beacons, right, that um, can be, I think there are people looking at leveraging that in, in RTLS applications. Mm -hmm. but, it, but again, if you need to record the location of multiple assets in a physical area, right, mm -hmm. then there's something that needs to read that information. It's not a matter of, I'm transmitting a signal, yeah. and you've come into range of the signal. Right. Right? That does it. So uh, you mentioned earlier in the podcast, uh, Quipa, if I pronounced that correctly. As, Quipa, as Quipa, 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 yeah. Quipa, right? They're, they're as, as, as having so, uh, a, an innovation. Yeah, yeah. Right? And they're able to accurately determine the location of a beacon. Yes. Um, uh, but what did you also say? You said that they have a, a fixed infrastructure device that yes. would be equivalent to a reader. Yes. You said it was around $500. Yes. So now we're talking about that being somewhat in the range, right, yeah. of a fixed infrastructure RFID reader, yeah. okay? Then on top of that, you have the cost of the beacon or the, 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 the Bluetooth device itself. Yeah. So if we're looking and comparing that to RAIN, where we simply have a chip on a piece of uh, and a label and yeah. it costs pennies, yeah. you're talking about a printed circuit board and, um, uh, and a power source yeah. uh, and um, uh, w reliability issues related to all of those things over time and yeah. you have replaced batteries yeah. and a cost factor. Yeah. So um, uh, there's, uh, I don't doubt that there are some use cases mm -hmm. that you can look at where maybe finer precision of the location or maybe to um, the need to be tracking high, high assets that are moving at high speed mm -hmm. where a solution uh, like this Quipa uh, might be um, mm -hmm. preferable. And, and, and I'm sure there are going to be other innovations. So um, I imagine that there's going to be some space for uh, BLE beacons in RTLS uh, and, and in other asset tracking uh, spaces. And, uh, but uh, without a doubt, uh, RAIN RFID is going to maintain its place where the number of assets that are being tracked in a given area is high because of the, 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 the lower tag costs. And because there are a number of ways to skin the cat in terms of tracking those assets. You can um, have two or three handheld devices, and that may be all you need for uh, scanning an entire retail store mm -hmm. or entire uh, warehouse. You can set up uh, uh, choke points um, that, uh, you know, as tagged assets travel from one point to another point, it generates an alert, and you now know it's in, in, in mm -hmm. a new zone. Mm -hmm. um, and you could have a full wide area system where you, um, it, it, that, the nature of that real-time reading of tags mm -hmm. uh, has distinct value. Mm -hmm. And in uh, understanding the, the location and the movement of the location, understanding um, being able to track state changes of those, those assets in software, um, where uh, the, there's, there's clear value in a more expensive infrastructure-based solution, yeah. right? So there's a, 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 you, you, you don't necessarily need to assume that because a reader may be $800 or $2,000, mm -hmm. uh, that the infrastructure costs are going to be prohibitive in an RFID solution. Now, if you just have a very few number of assets, right, in that type of scenario, uh, a, a beacon approach may be, in fact, a lower cost approach. Right? Yeah, I think that this is clearly a spreadsheet you could build that, that looks at that, the, the proportion of the tag con, uh, cost versus the infrastructure. I'm going to assert that the BLE infrastructure is a lot cheaper because it isn't just your $500 um, uh, readers, and, and, and there's a range. There's, uh, Fathom is another uh, one of the, the players in that space that uh, I was searching for. And so their, their price range, I would say, goes from maybe three to $600. But you also have this other class of reader from companies like Contact.io and who knows, maybe even Estimote, where they're basically talking about less than $100 for uh, a, a reader that can read these tags. So I'm going to say that it's, generally speaking, a lot cheaper and I'm uh, the, the accuracy varies significantly and I think uh, that's one of the things where you have to look at individual providers on both sides but I, I'm going to assert that getting high accuracy from Bluetooth is something that it, it's reasonable now but it's going to get a lot better as angle of arrival technology which Cooper use and other people claim they use as well 
it's going to be in the Bluetooth standard this year. I, uh, that's what we expect. And so I think there's going to be just this incredible, highly accurate real-time positioning of assets, and there's a modest number of them, then clearly Bluetooth is the way to go. But if you want very high performance reading a very large number of assets, then I would concede that RFID is in, in good shape because you guys do talk about read rates in the thousands per second, um, and we don't even have that. I, I bet you if you looked in the spec sheet of most of the Bluetooth hubs, they wouldn't say what the, the read rate is because they just don't think about it in those terms. They're not thinking about tracking sweaters in a Benetton or a, a retail environment like that. Okay, we didn't get the fisticuffs. Let's see, so, but it's probably time to summarize. Um, uh, so it seems to me, looking at what you guys have been doing in RFID, um, you, you actually have better R, I think you have better RF characteristics because your, uh, the spectrum you're using is, it basically has be better propagation. Maybe there's some issues because of the low power nature um, maybe, maybe we can win a little bit in the Bluetooth world where we have a strong battery. So there's maybe some advantages there. I would say the ecosystem of providers in the Bluetooth world is pretty amazing because we're starting off with handsets that are being sold in their millions. And I think these lower cost hubs are really gonna take off, but I can't predict the extinction of the RFID business. I actually think that that's going to grow. Where do you see RFID going? Is RFID flourishing or is it stagnant? No, it's absolutely flourishing. I mean, uh, what, what I've observed is a steadily raising tide of uh, the adoption of RAIN RFID in a very large number of industries, um, and an infinite variety of, of use cases. I mean, generally it boils down to tracking inventory assets and people. But if you look at the creative ways that are being used to deploy um, RFID in, you know, in, in healthcare, in logistics, um, in manufacturing, in the energy sector, uh, in retail, it, in libraries, it goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, w w w without a doubt, you, you just see more and more adoption continuing. So we don't see that slowing. Well, I think this has been a great start to the conversation and the debate about where to use one technology versus another. So Mike, thanks very much for coming in and uh, helping us get a bit smarter about that. One thing I do predict is that there's all sorts of things that we won't have covered and that there's going to be really smart people out there that will want to tell us that. Uh, and I welcome that uh, on the YouTube channel, on Twitter, on Facebook. People should chime in and, and tell us where we miss something and where the gaps are. And uh, it, it's a fascinating subject. Thank you very much, Steve. So we have two drummers in the room, <laughs> you and Don. That's right. Um, so no shortage of musical interest. Have you been able to get down to the three songs that you would take to Mars? I have, and thank you for asking. I think it's wonderful that you end every show with this question. It's uh, near and dear to my heart, a topic near and dear to my heart. So I thought about it and uh, came up with the three that I would take on a mission to Mars. I think that's yeah, yeah. right. That's what we're looking for here. So the first uh, would have to be a song from the artist that I've probably listened to more than any other artist in my lifetime, just in terms of over the decades, and it never gets tired to me. And, and that's a jazz artist named uh, Pat Metheny. I'm sure most people know who that is, or yeah. many people do. And um, there's something about his music that uh, really appeals to me. It's great background music, so I can have it on while I'm working, right? Yeah. And. Uh, of all of his songs, I would choose uh, the song First Circle. And uh, that song uh, features um, uh, an artist that he has in the band that um, uh, he sings vocals, but as though it's, there's no words, no lyrics, it's as, it's, it's, it's as though it's an instrument. All right. And that particular composition evokes um, a very positive spirit, a lot of high, great energy, and um, that vocal uh, as, a, as an instrument that I just described is something that if by chance I should encounter any uh, extraterrestrial life forms, 
it might give I'd like them to communicate the the soul of the human spirit All right. in a way that they could understand through yeah. that music so, so they don't need the vocabulary but they'll get the essence of the human spirit exactly from, from that vocalization right I first started listening to Pat Metheny back in the mid 80s early 80s I was in college and I got into this habit of playing it after parties, and so my friends said, oh, this is your hangover music, isn't it? Right. <laughs> so there you go. It's uh, meaningful to me, too. Okay, so that's number one. And number two, I, I had to pick a song that would evoke the raw spirit and anger and energy of rock and roll to the core, mm -hmm. right? And there's a million considerations, but I, I ended up with God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols. Fantastic. Nice and raw and energy, and then they, I, I have to have that with me. Yeah. And then for the third selection, given that I can only bring three, I figured I should pick a, a song that would take an entire album side or longer, so that at least I could get the most music out of my, uh, my mission. And so I started thinking about, okay, what songs do I really like that would uh, in, in consume an entire album side? I considered Mountain Jam by the Allman Brothers Band. Mm -hmm. has a drum solo in it, so yeah. that would be cool. In fact, I think it's two uh, album sides. I considered uh, Close to the Edge by Yes, but I ended up with another one of my favorite bands growing up. I loved prog rock, Genesis, so I'd pick uh, Supper's Ready by Genesis, if you know that song. All right, so that was, was that early Genesis early with Genesis. Peter Gabriel. That's correct. All right. That's correct, although I choose the version on the live album Seconds Out, which has Phil Collins singing. Ah, so there you go, there's my three songs. And I just got to ask you about the Sex Pistols. As a drummer, do you listen to their drumming? The drumming, I can't remember the name of the drummer, but was he any good or was it just like raw enthusiasm? You know, the thing about punk music is it was the first form of music that um, you didn't have to be good uh, to be wonderful. Yeah. And that's what inspired so many kids to do it because they realized I just need to have the spirit and go do what I can do, whatever that is, with no technical chops whatsoever and make great music. It's all about the anger and the energy. So there you go. Ah, well, I spent the weekend listening to um, uh, interviews with a music selected by a guy called John Peel, who people in this country probably won't know, but he was the Radio 1 DJ, which was the, at the time the only national radio station. He was the Radio 1 DJ that broke the Sex Pistols. He also broke David Bowie and Pink Floyd. Yes. And um, uh, it was, I was so admire him because he was like all into this long hair stuff and then punk came along and he just switched and he completely jettisoned his old audience and he was an older guy but he just recognized that raw uh, energy and he loved it yeah. and uh, so I've got so much uh, respect for him. Very good, thanks for your three songs. Thanks for asking. All right. The Mr. Beacon Podcast is sponsored by Williot. Scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth.